You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and this has been a long time coming. I think this is the longest stretch I've gone without talking to this man since I started this podcast, which is insane. But it's good because it means he's that busy. Travis, thank you so much for coming back on. I'm sorry it was so long to get you back on the show. Hey, that's all right. Thank you for having me back on. You know, I mean, we we missed some connections there uh, back over the spring. I was just, you know, walloped with business, so... But that's the whole point of this. That's that's a good problem to have. It is. You're actually that busy right now. Yeah. Yep. So it's still it's still rolling with the punches. You know. I mean, it's uh, you know, my I've got some time here in August. Uh, but my you know this end of July, you know, is pretty well booked up. Um, uh, so it's a it's a good problem to have. You know, with that being said, what is the perfect world for this when you're guiding and you don't have a jet boat? You just don't turn a key and then you go to your spot. You are paddling. You're doing a lot of physical labor. So in your perfect world, would it be like a guided trip, a day off, a guided trip, a day off? Or because we were talking about before we started, guys, that you went like eight days in a row, which yeah. is just insane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think honestly, the more ideal thing would be to treat it kind of like you know, a Monday through Friday, you know, kind of job, um, you know, the, the hours are longer, you know, than a nine to fiver. Um, but you know, five days, five days, I could do definitely do five days in a row, uh, without wearing myself down too, too hard. Um, you know, when you get on those eight day stretches, uh, you know, I find myself crawling out of bed and I'm thinking of that, uh, that old Dunkin' Donuts commercial, you know, where the guy crawls out of bed at, you know, the crack of dawn and he says, time mm-hmm. to make the donuts. Yep. So that's, you know, kind of how I feel, you know, when I crawl out of bed and it's, uh, you know, six o'clock in the morning or five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. So it's oh, get on my, my ducks gosh, in a row. That's but insane. yeah, five days, five days would be fine, you know, straight. Uh, a day off, day on, I just kind of feel like, I don't know, maybe I lose a little bit of touch with, uh, you know, the water and stuff. So then, you know, with that said, and you being in touch with the water, wh- where have you been fishing? Has it just been the Shenandoah, or are you, are you branching out to other places? I've been doing a lot on the Potomac, uh, as well as the Shenandoah. So the Potomac, uh, you know, the bonus of the Potomac is that it is a much more um, well-known waterway than the Shenandoah is. Uh, Shenandoah is the largest tributary that pours into the, into the Potomac. But, uh, you know, a lot of folks, I think identify in here, you know, they think of Potomac, they think of Harper's Ferry, Washington, DC, uh, you know, it is the, the nation's, you know, the, the nation's river, uh, you know, flowing right through the capital. Um, so I offer, uh, on my new website, both Potomac and Shenandoah trips, um, and I had sworn off the Potomac there for a while because uh, it just wasn't fishing very well. Um, then last year, some other friends of mine that are guides um, and that religiously run the Potomac there at Harper's Ferry uh, had said that, you know, just in, in talking, uh, I, you know, asked how the Potomac was fishing. And, and my, my good friend John Hayes said, well, it was fishing really well. Well, I thought, you know, I need to find out and see, you know, the proof is in the pudding. And so went out, had phenomenal uh, day on the Potomac. Uh, We were catching a lot of these like 14 to 16 inch fish. I mean, just repeatedly. And we'd have like 40 of those at times in the boat in a day. Wow. Uh, Which, you know, is great action. A lot of fun, Uh, you know, still catching some larger fish, Uh, but we weren't, you know, we, you know, of course had the dinks, but weren't wading through the dinks kind of like we are now, you know, this time of the year, I mean, it's dink city out there on both rivers. You know I mean? It's just, you know, lots of tail grabs, you know, uh, you know, these fish eating, eating baits that are almost as big as they are, or at least trying to eat baits that are almost as big as they are. And so, um, yeah, so I kind of moved and started doing some more on the, on the Potomac, uh, but on my website, I offer Potomac and Shenandoah trips. And as a matter of fact, yesterday I just finished up 
a Potomac trip with clients and they had actually booked two trips. So they're going to fish. They fished the Potomac yesterday, taking today off and then fishing the Shenandoah tomorrow. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good one. You know, I mean, I decided with the guys who work with my website and stuff like that, um, you know, to go ahead and instead of making it a Potomac and Shenandoah uh, float fishing trips to make it a Potomac or Shenandoah float fishing trip, give folks, uh, you know, another option. Uh, let them think about, um, you know, fishing another, uh, another river. Um, and then earlier, I just got off the phone with a guy who, you know, booked a trip. He lives in Maryland, but he wants to fish a Shenandoah. So, you know, I'll let them make their, you know, pick what river they want. Uh, you know, if one's blown out, I mean, obviously I will, uh, you know, make the call and call the customer and, you know, discuss with them, you know, options, you know, and that's the nice thing about this is that we've got the Shenandoah and the Potomac. So lots, lots of river to fish. No, we have so much water around here and it's, it's so great to finally be seeing, I know we, we shot a hidden gems episode. Uh, it feels like a, a year ago now, but uh, uh, back in the winter time and the whole catch line with that was like the river's back. It's not what it was like 10 years ago where you couldn't catch anything. You're starting to see the size. Um, yeah. I had, there was a huge kayak tournament, uh, Northern Virginia kayak association, and you could pick between the Shenandoah, the upper Potomac or the Rappahannock. And most of the people that were in the top 10, they chose the Shenandoah, which shows mm -hmm. you that that river really is coming back from basically just near death. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It sure is. <laughs> it's a good thing. I mean, and there's an, there's, you know, Thomas, there's like an ebb and flow to, you know, how these rivers are and, and, and stuff. Uh, you know, like I said, I'd sworn off the Potomac there for a while. Uh, and, uh, you know, she came back and then in, in late, uh, March, uh, I went to a, uh, was invited to a meeting, uh, with the, uh, Potomac or, uh, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia and the, in the, um, uh, USGS fisheries biologists. And they all gave us, um, uh, you know, what's going on with uh, the Susquehanna, the Shenandoah, and the Potomac. And um, uh, it was an interesting meeting. Um, everything seems to be, you know, okay. But, uh, you know, there is an ebb and flow. At the end of the meeting, I was standing out in the foyer and uh, caught up with the Maryland uh, biologists and I was just wanted to thank them for, you know, how they'd done such a great job with the Potomac and stuff. And they have done a great job with the Potomac. Uh, you know, they, they saw the signs, they, they knew that they needed to act, uh, to get the, the small mouth back up to where they were. And, uh, the, the one biologist, uh, Mike says to me, he says, Oh, you says you're talking about those 14 to 16 inch fish that you guys caught last year. I was like, yeah, he's like, we don't know where they came from. Hmm. <laughs> Which I was, a, I was a head scratcher. And, uh, so like I said, you know, in, in leading to what I'd said earlier, you know, that there's like, there's an ebb and flow, um, you know, to these, to these rivers and stuff. And, could you elaborate that on that a little bit more? What, what, do they mean jokingly? We don't know where they came from, or is it like we don't oh, know no, why the was, size is there? He was very serious. So they they from what I understand, they chemically like when they stock fish, they like chemically ID these fish, and it's something with like the inner ear bone of the fish. And so when they harvest fish to take tissue samples and you know whatever else biologists do that. Uh, they can identify whether it's a stocked fish or not, you know, kind of like trout with the adipose fin, um, you know, so they can, you know, they can mark these fish. And so any ones that they harvest, they can say, okay, well, this is, you know, one of our stockers from 2019, um, you know, so. Hmm. That's interesting. Yes. So what they're saying is these fish have nothing to do with what they stocked. They're all natural. <sighs> Would the offspring, though, of the fish that they do the the, the dying to the to the lids, mm -hmm. would they still have that dye if they're offspring? That, that's interesting. Oh, that, that's huh. a good question. That's a good question. I, maybe I'll send Mike an, an email and ask him. 
Yeah, have Mike get in contact with me because I've been I've yeah. been trying for like two months now to get Jason Halliker on the show. Mm-hmm. I've been really trying to get Jason on the show to talk about the smallmouth program that's going on in Front Royal, Virginia right now. Yeah. Uh, I've seen little clippets and stuff. It looks like they're actually they have smallmouth now. They have been putting them in the river allegedly. So that's yeah. really good news then. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But so, yeah, I'll 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 pass. Uh, um. Mike and uh, John Mulliken's uh, information on to you. Yeah. And, and then, guys, again, huge shout out to John. We had him on last fall to talk about the flathead issue that's yeah. going on at Dam 4 and 5, Big Slack on the Upper Potomac. That is interesting. And that's a whole episode of like, okay, so the fish just showed up and they don't know why. I mean, that that is interesting. But on the same token, like they do have a program right now for, for supplemental stocking. Virginia has a supplemental stocking program. You know, we're all pushing it in the right direction here. And then, of course, we have a walleye fishery that feels like it just popped out of nowhere. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like it's like when if you're not shopping for a car, you don't see the signs for a used car. But once you are, I have just been noticing now the last like year and some change how many more walleye are being caught out of the upper in the Shenandoah. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, they're there. Well, I mean, back, you know, over the, you know, it was right before Thanksgiving. I mean, I, I boated that one on the Shenandoah that was 29 and a half inches, 10 and a half pounds. Mm-hmm. That's huge. That's freaking That's monstrous. monster walleye. What, what, how right now is the Shenandoah fishing? Just in general right now. We, we, we're basically in, we're in August right now. It's the, the hottest part of the year. You have the yeah. lowest flow rates, generally speaking. Pretty much it's just rafts that can deal with the main portion of Shenandoah, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could do, you know, canoes and kayaks could definitely do it, but you know, anything bigger or heavier, um, you know, those, those boats are, you know, you got to go to deeper water with those. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Shendo's fishing, fishing really well. I mean, it's the fish are active. Uh, last week when I was out on the Shenandoah, I mean, I had within 150 yards of the, of the, uh, put in boat ramp. I, I had an 18 inch fish in the boat. So, um, you know, it's, they're there, uh, and you're seeing them, uh, you know, as far as like tactics and stuff like that, uh, you know, if you look, sometimes you'll see fish in some of the shallow water, uh, but you can't write that shallow water off. You got to make a cast to it because these fish are all over the place and you could throw just about anything at them and it's going to get eaten at some point in time. Um, hmm. You know, uh, but a lot of times what I just focus on when I'm out, out there is, um, the deeper, the deeper water, the green water, you know, that's what I tell folks, you know, when we're fishing, when we're floating down the river, look for that green water, those deeper spots, uh, even if it's that deeper spots, only a foot and a half deep, uh, it could potentially hold a monster. Uh, you see a lot of the fish popping out of the shadows and stuff of ledges. Uh, you know, they're just holding up in there, whether they're, you know, <clears throat> hiding from predators or, you know, just trying to stay out of, uh, you, know, you know, the, the warmer water, you know, I'm sure, you know, the water within that little shadows, you know, probably just a, a little bit cooler. Uh, um, but, uh, and then also, you know, some, you know, really good oxygenated water. Uh, when you start getting down into those ledges and stuff, um, that's a real good place to focus. And that's definitely um, seems to be where, uh, you know, the magic happens is in that more aerated water. Uh, because we are in the doldrums of summer. We've been at low uh, water levels since, I mean, early, mid to early May. Um you know, back in late May and in, into June, I mean, we were at levels like on the Potomac. Uh, the Harper's Ferry gauge was like at one point in time was registering one foot or even just under a foot, uh, wow. which is low. And in that time of the year, we just don't, you know, that's generally not the levels. You know, those are summertime levels, uh, August, um, July and August levels. Um, so, but yeah, the Shandos fishing well. It, the rain patterns that we have this year, it, it seems like we're in kind of a drought, generally speaking. Yeah. And there are pros and cons to that. And so I want to break it down to two halves of the question. How did the rain patterns this year affect the spawn? And then how are the rain patterns this year going to affect the summertime fishing? 
Well, how the rain pattern uh, affected the spawn uh, is a really good question. Uh, I think that, um, I think, I mean, the spawn was earlier this year than it has been in, a, in, in years past. Uh, I mean, we were hitting pre-spawn fish, you know, in the middle of, in, you know, early to mid April. Uh, wow. And generally that kind of wow. happens like a little bit more towards the end of April, uh, late April. Uh, but they were definitely in their spawning positions, uh, you know, and that whole pre-spawn, you know, kind of set up, you know, and I mean, you got to think, you know, I mean, these fish don't all spawn at the same time. Uh, there is a succession of, of the spawn. And um, so, uh, but it was, uh, I mean, and I've got to say, man, pre-spawn was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. phenomenal so I'll, I'll, I'll fill you in a, a little bit more on that um and then as far as so like right now i mean we, we're in an el nino summer is what we're in and so that means two things hot and dry and we've definitely had you know quite a bit of heat maybe not as hot as what it obviously could be um but the dryness is here and um so you know, it, I think that, you know, lower water, uh, warmer water temps, you know, certainly will will affect the fish, um, stress them out a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm not a biologist, you know, by any means, but, uh, you know, it definitely seems to be, um, you know, a bit of a, I mean, a bit of an issue. I mean, the fish are there. Uh, you know, I, my suggestion is, you know, if you go, you go out and fish, you know, catch them, take a pick get them back in the water, um, you know, as soon as you can. At this time of year, what kind of uh, water temperatures are you seeing and just spitballing wise? Oh, mid eighties. Mid wow. Damn, right. <laughs> I know it's warm. <laughs> yeah. That that's insane. Right now. That. <laughs> and, and it's so funny cause this is the time of year. And I think I, I know I've talked about this to every river guide I've had on the show, but it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like this is the time of year people want to book trips, but it's the yeah. worst time of year to catch a trophy. <laughs> It is. <laughs> I mean, when you and I go out there and we have the whole place to ourselves and it's the day after Christmas, but then every time you stick one, it's, it's beautiful. It's just, it's so weird. People's mindsets that I want to yeah. go out in August. Yep. Yep. I agree. I agree. I, man, I, if there was one thing that I could do as a guide would be to try and steer folks to, uh, to try and stay away from the, the, the mid summer, uh, mid to late summer, um, you know, fishing trips just for the sole fact that, I mean, you're just wading through the dinks, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to get to the big fish. So, you know, you get those dinks out there and, you know, they're just, they're hammering the, they're do, doing a lot of tail grabbing on your baits and stuff, never fully committing, you know, you, you get them in close to the boat and then all of a sudden they just open their mouth and, you know, your bait comes flying out of the water because, you know, it didn't even have the, the hook wasn't even in it. So. Uh, what, we had what, some good, we had, we had a couple good fish, uh, yesterday, but they, you know, these big boils and stuff on baits, uh, but just, you know, we just couldn't seem to, you know, stick a hook in them and, and get them to the boat, but at least they're there. No, I mean, absolutely. And with that said, with the dinks, what, what adjustments do you make right now to your bait and everything to be able to try to turn the, those nibbers into, into eaters? Uh, you know, so, so like I've been throwing a lot of, um, super flukes lately, zoom super flukes and the, uh, um, uh, Z man jerk shads, which I love those things because you can run a jerk shad. I mean, I mean, you can fish one jerk shad that you pull out of the pack all day long. And, uh, but, um, so, you know, a lot of times what I end up trying to do is trying to move that hook a little bit further to the back. Um, you know, I one day tried, went in, you know, went to purchase, uh, some hooks, uh, the hooks were downsized. Like they didn't, they had two odd instead of, you know, four odd. And I thought, all right, well, you know, at least it's the right weight, you know, and it's, it's everything that I'm looking for with other than the fact that it's not quite the right size. And so I started trying to run those baits and actually the line into the head of that fluke. Uh, and put that hook further, further towards the back, closer to the tail. 
Uh, and it seems to have worked. I've done all kinds of things, you know, I've gone to the point of trying to, you know, tie on like a trailer treble hook, you know, and pin it back there or just, you know, a trailer, single trailer hook, uh, you know, like on a swim bait or something like that. And, and actually literally like stick it into the, um, into the paddle tail. Um, and you know, it works. It, it doesn't work sometimes. Um, you know, so, and then, you know, then you end up with another problem, you know, you've got line tied to mm -hmm. a hook, you know, that has another hook on it. And so, you know, more potential for, you know, something to go awry and, and lose a fish. But, uh, you know, big thing is, you know, you don't want to let the fish, you know, chew on those things for very long because then they end up gut hooked and, uh, you know, that's no fun. Um, so, you know, you just kind of deal with those tail bites and, you know, eventually you're going to get one that's going to full on inhale that thing and, you know, you'll get a proper hook set on them. How's the fly fishing right now? Uh, do you have more or less fly fishing uh, clientele in the summertime compared to other months? Uh, you know, it's still about like about 20% of my clients are fly, fly, fly or die guys uh, and girls. Um, you know, this Friday I have fly fishing trip. Um, uh, you know, some of my fly rod guys, uh, are, are, you know, they hit me up a lot back in the spring. Uh, and then, you know, they're kind of like, you know, it's summertime, you know, we'll wait it out a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, you get the ones that, you know, top water, I mean, you know, you could fish top water flies, you know, poppers and, and things of that nature, uh, Dahlberg divers and stuff like that. You know, you could fish those all day long uh and and get bites on them um so fly fishing is still still good uh you know and two like fly riders tend to be a little bit more uh forgiving i you could say in the size of the fish they're just appreciative a lot of times just to have a fish on the end of the line that's a lot more work uh with a fly rod than it is with a uh spinning rod so uh, you know, the amount of casts that you can make with a spinning rod compared to a fly rod, uh, you know, outweighs, you know, the, the fly rod. So, um, you know, they tend to be a little bit more, you know, I think fly rod or fly rod guys tend to be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, conservation oriented, uh, you know, appreciative of, you know, just any fish biting. You know, when I first started fly fishing, folks would see me out there and obviously, you know, the, they think, you know, well, you know, he's must be out there in that river fishing for trout. And, uh, you know, they would ask me, you know, what are you fishing for? And my reply was always whatever's biting. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Pan fish, you know, smallies, you know, the occasional, uh, catfish, you know, if I was, uh, you know, happened to be at the right place at the right time, you know, a nice, uh, you know, 10 pound carp on the fly. How's the carp fishing right now? Is that something that you're ever looking at pursuing specifically? Yeah. You know, it, it's really tough with the carp fishing. Uh, it's kind of a waiting game. Uh, you know, you, you can, you know, sometimes these carp move through areas almost like clockwork. You can almost set your watch by it and uh, by when they move through. And so, you know, really, I mean, as far as carp fishing on the fly, you know, the best way to get them is when they're mudding. All right. And that's when they're nose down and they're just churning up that hmm. bottom, mudding it up. You know, you could put a woolly booger on, you could put a claw dad on, uh, you know, and drop it, you know, a foot in front of them. And then eventually they're going to work their way up to it. Uh, you know, carp aren't, aren't really, really well known uh, to chase, uh, you know baits to chase them down um you know it, it's it's tough because we just went through you know 2021 when we had the brood 10 cicadas i mean man that spoil a person for carp fishing you know <laughs> uh, dude uh, the stories you told to me about that it's just insane just like almost a topwater carp bite that's insane it was it was <laughs> I still, I still talk about it and revel in it to this day. Uh, and I've got 15 more years to wait for the next one. So with that said, I just, I've always found this fascinating that that is a, a, a fish 
that really needs to get more hype where it comes to if you are a fly fisherman that is a trash bone fish is what it is you hook yeah. one of those 15 20 pound carp on a fly rod that's a heck of a fight that you're in oh yeah hang on and it's and it's hard to catch them and, yeah. and the other thing that's big is like the cat fishing and for the shenandoah are you seeing any flathead or is it still just channel cats that you're seeing so the meeting that I went to back in late March, uh, Jason had said that they were finding flathead above the Millville Dam on the Virginia stretch in the Sh- of the Shenandoah. Hmm. Uh, that was disheartening to hear uh, because I've seen what, uh, you know, I mean, we can't say that it's just the problem on the, on the, on the uh, Potomac is just the flathead, you know, it's like a perfect storm. It's a lot of, a combination of things, you know, coming together to make, you know, to have made the fishing, you know, not so great on the upper Potomac, um, you know, high water events, uh, introduction of, uh, you know, flathead catfish, you know, and stuff like that. Um, you know, bad, you know, high water events around spawn and post spawn. Um, but so it was disheartening to hear that there were flathead in the main stem of the Shenandoah in the Virginia um section of the shenandoah so um but i i you know as much as i float the shenandoah and knock on wood i have not come across any flatheads so it's funny because for all the people that hate the millville dam and and the dam at riverton i really think that that was a bulwark for such a long time of keeping them out of the shenandoah main stem and so again just for for my people that that do get upset about all the dams that we have it can also be a benefit to stop invasive species like that yeah and hopefully that they maybe they don't explode knock on wood again that's another reason i need to get jason hallecker on the show again so we can kind of like talk about that stuff too because that's yeah that's some interesting things to well the the potomac but the potomac biologists the maryland biologists uh told us at a meeting back and i think it was 2019 uh that any of the flatheads that we caught on the potomac um to dispatch them uh take them home eat them Mm -hmm. whatever do not release them back into the water alive uh just to try and knock their numbers down a little bit you're never going to eradicate them um you know that that's that's an impossible feat um so you know, we just have to deal with it. You know, same way with snakeheads. You know, snakeheads are in the Potomac. Uh, we had one boated uh, from a fellow guide last year on that Harper's Ferry stretch. Uh, okay. One snakehead. So I saw two. I at least, you know, I can't say like for sure that they were snakeheads, but I like to think that I'm very well in tuned with what's going on in the river and, and, and visually what I'm seeing. And twice last year, I saw something that I could not, it was a head scratcher. I was like, I don't know what that was. That wasn't, wasn't a, it wasn't a catfish. It wasn't a small mouth. wasn't a musky. Uh, you know, what was that? And the only thing I can think of is that it was snakehead, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm not used to seeing snakehead. So um, one was a fish yeah. came up in an eddy and gulp, gulped air off the surface and, hmm. uh, and then went, it just disappeared. And it was like, I caught it out of the corner of my eye and I was like, all right, that was, that was weird. Hmm. So, that, that's interesting because there is debate, you know, online, take good that which you will, because, you know, the yeah. internet is so good for just correct information. <laughs> Stirring the pot. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> that I heard that like snakehead again, this is based allegedly on stuff on the internet that they don't like fast moving water. And so the idea was like, Oh, they couldn't take to the Shenandoah or the upper Potomac, but it yeah. sounds like that might not be true. And they, they are in there. Right. Cause I, 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 just like you, I know people have caught them from the upper Potomac enough. People have said that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. That'll be fascinating to see what happens. I mean, yeah. the good news is if they get in there thick, you're going to have a great guide service because <laughs> people will pay no you. Doubt. Oh my God. Add, add that insane. species to the list. It, I'm telling you, I thought trout or musky was a cult of anglers. Those snakehead guys, that is a tribe. Yes. They are addicted to catching those things. It's insane how passionate yeah. they are. Go go to go on social media and just look up, find any of those snakehead uh, uh, groups, uh, you know, those pages. 
mm-hmm. and you see some real fanatics, man, snakehead fanatics. Do you ever, and this is a completely uh, 180 on topics, at this time of year with the heat the way it is, do you ever do or have any tips for night fishing the rivers? You know, I, I do. Um, like, I don't offer them, and that's funny that you say that because that, just like a week ago, I was like, you know, I was like, I need to like offer like an evening trip, you know, like start at like 12 mm-hmm. and fish until dark, you know, till the sun sets. Um, because man, I mean, it can be really magical there, you know, two, three hours prior to the sun setting, uh, for top water. And I mean, really, I mean, who doesn't like top water fishing? Dude, and that's the thing I remember growing up as a kid fishing the main stem uh, near near the dam there uh, and up to, to, to Watermelon Park is once yeah. once the sun is just about to go, you can throw any type of top water and it's it's game on. You might not catch the biggest, but it is so right. much fun. Right. And I have done like night fishing, like, you know, croak floats uh, where, you know, you pick a full moon and you know, go out and fish headlamps, uh, stuff like that, um, you know, and just fish. Now, you know, you're bound to lose some, some, you know, some lures or, you know, um, you know, baits or, or, or flies, you know, fishing, you know, at night in the dark, um, you know, on some stuff, but you definitely, you're not floating with the headlamps on and, you know, you got this big, beautiful, you know, full moon out. And those fish will feed through the night. I mean, they'll, huh. you know, you'll, you'll find them. They'll move up a lot of times into the shallows, like bigger fish move up in the shallows. And, you know, the fish are opportunistic anyways. They'll, they'll eat when they, when a meal's presented to them. And, uh, you know, it's rare for them to just kind of turn something down. If they turn something down, it's because it doesn't quite look right. With that said, what are your go-to topwater lures this time of year? Is it still the Zoom Super Fluke, just fish on the surface, or do you do any poppers, things like that? Uh, you know, I mean, you can't go wrong with Whopper Plopper. That is very true. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can fish it, you know, you can burn it back like a buzz bait. You can sit it and pop it. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, it's it's a pretty versatile. Uh, and also very, you know, expensive, uh, <laughs> uh, bait. So, uh, but, you know, as long as you're not thrown into the, throwing it into trees and stuff like that, I mean, you know, it gets eaten, uh, generally like on the Potomac, uh, when I run the Potomac trips, my go-to in the morning, uh, when we put in, because we put in above dam three, which is an old defunct dam there above Harper's Ferry, we put in there and, uh, run that and i will i will uh start off it's almost like a lake uh the water's so Mm -hmm. calm and it's got some depth to it uh but my generally what i'm doing is you know we're having these guys throw in uh uh, whopper ploppers first thing in the morning and uh we've had some really good success some really nice sized fish come up and eat um you know and they come up off that bottom and they're you know they're dark you know because they've been in that deep water and and uh you know and just vicious you know vicious hits as a matter of fact yesterday we had we boated two that morning on top water baits so wow yeah so you know i mean I, you know it's a, it's a good way and it's also a good great way for me as a guide to kind of gauge you know these folks you know what's their casting ability and stuff like that you know that's so important because, again, that gets down to like what you're dealing with is a wide variety of talent levels from a guy that this is their first mm-hmm. time on their boat with their son to maybe someone that's a little bit more seasoned. Um, and yeah. it does limit the bait choice you can have where it's like, OK, maybe a walking bait could work, but it's like, but can your client even throw a walking bait correctly? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then expensive, like how expensive is it what you're dealing with? If you're throwing mega basses and the person is breaking one off every other cast. <laughs> I mean, yeah. good Lord, that's expensive. <laughs> that That's that's when I tell the client, all right, now comes the time where I'm going to start giving you the ones with the rusty hooks. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I tell you though, you showed me some things in jerkbaits the last time we went out with that colored rogue that you were throwing. It was not rogue, the mega bass. Like I, I've never thrown that color before. 
with, yeah. it's so interesting like how you can like really key in when you're on a body of water more than anybody else mm -hmm. yep well, yeah, definitely we, you know with all that said when does the transition really start are, are we do we still have another month of this super hot low flow water or when do you start seeing the change in, into fall uh i mean so as far as the fish are, fish are concerned uh you know, generally it's like kind of starting in September, um, and by by mid September, I really start to see we start to see these fish. Um, you know, in my mind, they're they realize that there's less sunlight, uh, water temperatures have cooled down a little bit. They know that you know the the uh, the winter is not far away so it's time to start eating and fattening up uh for uh, you know for that winter lull uh which you know like i said usually starts about uh early to mid-september so august you know it'll still be dink city out there i mentioned this uh when i had a when i had tyler on who's a who's a guy at lake anna and i really like your opinion on this too when it comes to the river is we always talk about the spring you have your your pre-spawn your your spawn your post spawn does summertime have a same type of pattern where you have your early summer your august and then is september its own summer deal thing yeah yeah i think so i mean like i said you know water temps generally could tend to cool down uh a little you know a bit and that really um uh, you know really uh promotes um uh, it seems like it, it just kind of calls those bigger fish to to want to chew because you know the bigger you are the more food you got to put in your belly uh you know to and you know you want to fatten up so that makes a lot of sense that really does yeah Do, uh, i thank you i can't thank you enough for coming on um i want to make sure that we get we can plug everything we have to plug and um if there's anything else that we forgot to talk about because we've covered a lot today yeah Oh, oh, well, we didn't talk anything about spawn <laughs> or post or pre-spawn. Oh, pre-spawn. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> it was a phenomenal pre-spawn. I, I keep forgetting it's been this long since I've had you on the show. It's like. We were, we, we were trying to get together, but dang it, I, I my schedule just was not. No, dude. That's wasn't the, working, you it's know. It's all good, man. That's the thing. It, mean, <laughs> it means you're being successful right now. But yeah, so um, yeah, talk, talk about it. Like, when did the spawn, the pre-spawn really get started? It was the best, it, it, in my years of guiding and stuff, by far the best uh, pre-spawn uh, session that we've ever had, man. I mean, it was just every day, monster fish coming into boats, monster smallies. Um, you know, some spots you could go and you could just, you just knew that they were there. Um, I had a day with a good friend of mine. And I'm not going to say exactly what body of water it was on or anything, but we boated nine citations, the two of us. It was fun fishing. It was late April. It was between between rains. Uh, we'd gotten rain on a Friday, uh, and it rained pretty heavily on Friday. Saturday was, uh, you know, they were calling for rain, but it wasn't going to be a torrential downpour. And then Sunday they were calling for like a downpour. Mm. And so I called my buddy up. I had somebody booked for that Saturday. I, they sent me a, a message, uh, texted me that they wanted to try and move the reschedule the trip. And I was like, man, uh, you know, like, you know, all right, you know, you can reschedule it. And so uh, we rescheduled it. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take advantage of this day off and uh, I'm going to go out and hit it. And we hit it and hammered nine citation smallmouth in one day. I had five. He had four. I was on the sticks. I mean, I pulled two citation smallmouth in Dang. one after the other. Was this a public body of water or private? Yes. It was public. Yes, it was a public body okay. of water. Just want to make sure you and, weren't at Lake uh, Fork or something. Somewhere down yeah. there. <laughs> and it was, oh, man, it was like, I mean, it was just, it, it's a day, like, it, that'll be a tough one to, to match. You know, I mean, how do you match nine citations in one day? You know, besides the place that you were at, was it the weather conditions too that kind of helped for I, that? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely weather conditions, and it was pre-spawn. I mean, we were like, yeah. 
right right smack dab in like kind of the middle of pre-spawn um it was uh just a phenomenal day man i mean like you couldn't do any wrong and we broke off on as many possible citations as what we voted we could have had we could have had double digits i mean it was it was just pandemonium man pure insanity i mean you know we were it was like one of those things like yeah we'll you know let's you know hit hit the uh boat ramp at like you know three or something like that and it was like by lunchtime it was like all right forget that man we're not making it to the boat ramp at three you know <laughs> we're gonna stay out till you know we're gonna play it all the way out so what do you think your best five went for weight wise if you could guess uh weight wise oh, man you know i had a couple five pounders uh there might have been i don't remember but there might have been at least a a uh five and a half pounder Dang. in there and then the rest were fours but they were fours and they were in in the in that 20 inch um you know size so i mean it was it was amazing i mean and i specifically because like i usually work um like march and april um like i'll work a little bit you know on the side to try and you know get me ready you know put a little money in my pocket before the real busy season starts and um the place that i work for you know they said hey they said you know what do you what do you want to do you know you want some of these hours this was like late february and i was like yeah i'll take a few but i was like let's just make me part-time because i feel like when i work you know the month of march and the month of april i don't get to spend as spend as much time on the water so i lose touch with the the changes and stuff you know the positionings of yep. the fish and stuff and so uh it, it was a good it was a good move on my part um you know april came around and i didn't work any of that side job uh at all i was on the river the whole time and really stayed in tune uh with the changes in them so Dude, that's freaking awesome. I mean, and, and yeah. it, it's so interesting when you say that when you put so much time on the water to begin with, and even you are like, well, I can't take time off because I start lose, I start losing the feel. And mm -hmm. that is, you can't put a price on that when it comes to fishing bodies of water, where when you're out there every day, you get a sixth sense about how things should be and how things are setting up. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. If people want to book a trip with you, where do they go? They go to uh, kfguideservices.com or wegofish.com. I have two domain names. Uh, and so through that, through my website, you can see the calendar uh, with available dates. And you can also book it through the website as well. So it's a kind of a hands-free. Uh, it's really... Um, uh, it's, it's really helped me out a lot. You know, I do a lot of, um, before I had the calendar on the website and the ability to, uh, you know, book through the website and stuff like that. It was a constant, you know, phone calls, emails, texts, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, it could be relatively time consuming, uh, you know, calling folks back you know, shooting emails and stuff like that. Uh, this way it makes it way easier on me to, uh, and I can focus a little bit more on guiding and less on, you know, some of the hand holding. you know, for lack of a better term, you know, of, of getting people to, uh, you know, book a trip, you know, and so they can put a deposit down on the website, you know, I mean, it's, and book it all through the website, which is a, a great thing for me. It, it really is that balance between trying to do everything yourself and trying to automate what you can. I know that I run into mm -hmm. that with, with what I'm doing here right now. Um, yeah. but I'm glad that you were able to find that balance. Cause it is, it just, it makes your life easier. Yeah. Yeah. My, my Saturday trip, I was talking to that guy, uh, uh, earlier today. And, uh, so he mentioned something about like, he's, he's going fishing with his son, uh, on Saturday. And then he mentioned something about his, son-in-law that he's fished a bunch with his son-in-law and so uh, he was like well what if we needed a you know how would you do three people you know and i said well i'd have to get another boat and uh, you know i said you know as long as you give me two weeks ahead of time hmm. uh heads up notice usually i can 
I can get another uh, second boat. Um, you know, I just don't have somebody sitting on a bench, you know, waiting to be waiting to get in, get into the game. Um, you know, so uh, which multiple boat trips? I mean, man, they're a lot of fun, and I think some folks just don't take enough of, of an advantage of it. Um, you know, booking multiple boats because the boats, you know, we start out in the morning together, then we space out, uh, you know, get far enough away from each other. And then by lunchtime, we meet back up, you know, and, you know, the, the sit down and have lunch and folks are, you know, the guys are, you know, talking about whatever catches they've had and, and stuff like that, you know, and it's a really, really good time, uh, doing multiple boats. Dude, Travis, the bass slayer. I just saw your, uh, your name. Actually, I love that <laughs> again, guys, please give him a follow, please, uh, episode description, please book a trip with Travis. It really helps him out so he can keep doing this and bringing us advice. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you're one of the gyms of the area where, you know, even the scientists and everyone wants to know what you know about the river. Cause you're out there so much. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for everything. Uh, like, and subscribe to the channel guys. And we'll see you next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.